Good evening, brothers and sisters. Pastor Searles coming to you from Coach Chapel Free Will Baptist Church. It's been a while, holidays, weather, etc. But glory be to God, we are here together again. This time we're going to be coming from different verses because we're going back to topics. And the topic for tonight is, am I saved? Brothers and sisters, if you have to ask yourself that question, then there's an issue because you should know if you're saved or not. And if you're asking yourself, mm, I'm not sure, then we need to get some things straight. We're going to we're going to do a am I saved quiz tonight. And I want you to tell me what you think about it. I need some feedback. I'm always on Facebook and nobody ever gives me feedback. So I have to talk fast and I have to talk all the time. So let's slow it down a little bit tonight. So you ask yourself, am I saved? How did I get here? You know, when God created this earth and this universe, he created it. And he said it was very good after he finished creating everything. Number one, he said it was good. And then after he created man, he said it was very good. And all of a sudden, Satan came in because he was prideful and he fell from glory and he was cast out of heaven. And he created all of this chaos. It was never supposed to be like this. And we come along 6,000 years later and we ask the question, how in the world can I get to heaven? And am I standing at the gate or am I going away from the gate? So let me ask you this question. Number one, the first question, it's a 10 question quiz. The first question is, are you born again? Well, pastor, what do you mean by am I born again? Um, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? How do you do that? First of all, you admit that you are a sinner and without him, you're inevitably going to die and perish. And that he died on the cross and his father, God, raised him from the dead. And the only way you can be saved is simply by accepting the gift of eternal life from Jesus Christ. That's the first question you have to ask yourself if you're thinking, am I saved? Number one, you have to be born again. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ and repented of your sins, then you are not born again. Second question. How do you feel after you become born again, brothers and sisters? And that first question, the born again question, um, if you're saved, was the answer yes or no? Or you're not sure? Because there is no not sure. It's a yes or no answer. So the answer is yes. So we'll move on to number two. Number two, how do you feel after you become born again? Well, God said any that be in Christ he is a new creature. My question to you is, born again means that you are a new creature. Do you feel like a new creature or do you feel the same? You're not sure or you're not born again altogether. You should not feel the same. You should feel a burden that has been lifted off of your shoulder because Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are laid at, uh, labor in a heavy burden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly at heart and you shall find rest unto your soul for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So no, you should not feel the same. You should feel rejuvenated. You should feel relieved. You should feel a sense of security and you should feel a sense of zeal wanting to get to know this new person called Jesus Christ. The third question, so, so number one, you have to be born again Number two, you have to have a connection with God, so you have to feel different. Number three, do you love your children, parent, or your own life more than Jesus? Is the answer yes? Is the answer I have to think about that? Or is the answer no? Because the answer should be no. You should love Jesus more than you love anybody. Because if you love Jesus more than you do anybody, love it's something that will never fail and you can express Jesus to your loved ones and they can be with you for all eternity. Brothers and sisters, the fourth question. So the answer to the third question is, do you love Jesus more than you do anybody? 
Yes, you're supposed to love Jesus more than you do your spouse, your children, your your any family member or any person. Jesus is first. Number four, how do you feel about your sins? This is a good one. How do you feel about your sins? Do you hate sin and you flee from sin? Or let's say, I don't want to sin, but I can't stop myself. Are you saying that to yourself? Or do you love the sin? Because if you love the sin then something is wrong because whenever God came into your life, he said, if you love me, obey my commandments, which means go and sin no more. So if you're saved, you should flee from sin and you should not want to sin. Now, one of the questions was, I don't want to sin, but I can't stop. Yes, you can too, because it's a matter of deciding in your mind and asking God and praying and fasting to take that sin away from you. And God will not put no more on you than, than you can bear. And what God does, God tempts no man to sin because he cannot sin. What he does is he tests us to help us go higher and closer to him. Number five, is Jesus the only way to heaven? Everybody knows this answer because when Jesus was in the, the garden of Gethsemane, he asked God, his father, and he was sweating um, blood and sweat because the capillaries in his skin had burst because he was under such great duress. And he said, Father, if there's any way, any other way, could this cup pass for me? And God said, nope. He asked three times and the answer was no. So he had to go through with it. So, brothers and sisters, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Number six, do you forgive others who have sinned against you? If you are saved, do you forgive others who have sinned against you? I forgive and I forget. That's, that's one answer. I forgive, but I don't forget. That's another answer. I only forgive those I love or I don't forgive at all. You should forgive and you should forget. It's not I forgive, but I don't forget because when God forgives us, he throws it in the sea of forgetfulness and he never brings it up anymore. And that's how we're supposed to be because we're supposed to be Christ-like. Question number seven. Could you die for Christ? For example, decapitation. You know how people in the Middle East are, are beheaded by ISIS and Hamas and some of these other um, groups. Brothers and sisters, in the Great Tribulation, when the Antichrist comes in full power and he's controlled by Satan, then he will be decapitating anybody who does not accept the mark. Now, at any time, God can say, okay, that's it. Go get my saints. Why is it important to know and be saved when Jesus Christ comes back? Because if you're saved now and you believe by, by um, faith, then God is going to give you a glorified body and you're going to have that thousand year reign after the great tribulation period and you're not going to have to go through the tribulation. But if, you're, if, you're, if you somehow make it through that seven year tribulation with those 21 judgments, then uh, you're just going to be a person and you're going to have a regular body. But, but, if, but I'm going to have a glorified body because I'm saved now. So, so yes, during the tribulation, you will have to die for Christ. And if somebody looked, if, if something happened and, and Christ said that you had to die for him or you would live in heaven for hell for all eternity, would you die for Christ? The answer is yes. Will he ask you to die for him? No unless you're in the tribulation and he's not going to ask you to die for him. If you don't die for him, then in hell you will be for all eternity because his judgment will be poured out in the great tribulation and it will be poured out for all eternity after the great tribulation in a thousand year millennial reign. Number eight, do you believe the Bible to be 100% true? If you are a Christian, then you believe the Bible is 100% true. Yes, there are metaphors, metaphors and simile in there, but we know when it's 
when it's uh, stating the, the obvious and when it's stating a comparison. That is common sense. So, yes, if you are a Christian, you have to believe that the Bible is 100% true. You got to pick up the Bible if you're a Christian and you have to read the Bible. You have to study the Bible and you have to understand that what God said in this word reveals who God is. So once you get to know the Bible, you get to know God because God is the one who revealed this great work unto man. Brothers and sisters, number nine, how often do you pray and read scriptures? If you are a Christian, you should not eat, I mean, look at TV all the time. You should not listen to the radio all the time. Watch TikTok, Facebook. Of course, you should watch it whenever we're having Bible study and we're having church. But uh, you have to use your time wisely. And if you say you are saved, then it should be your desire to read your Bible and get to know God and to pray and to fast. And to get to know God. So yes, that's the criteria to knowing if you're saved. If you are not answering these questions correctly, then you need to reevaluate some things because you are tittering on the verge of not being a Christian. And look, here's some other things too. The last question I have is, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus? Is Jesus a good man? Is Jesus God in the flesh? Is Jesus a prophet or one of many gods? Number one, if you're a Christian, Jesus was God in the flesh, God incarnate, God who stepped out of glory, who came into his own and humbled himself and took on the form of a lowly baby in a manger. And you know what a manger was? It was a stable where animals were dung all over the uh, barn. Um, it, it was just, hey, it was just not befitting a pregnant woman having God and God humbled himself and came into the form of a peasant and, and, and uh, Satan tried to kill him instantaneously by having all the children murdered, not to mention um, he, he could have came as the king of kings and lord of lords, but he came low and humble. And he was a servant unto death. And so he is God in the flesh. And just to think about God uh, sacrificing himself to such a degree to save us because he was the only one who could propitiate our sins. That means atone for our sins. He was the only one who could pay the price for our sins. So yes, if you believe that God raised his son from the dead, that God stepped out of glory and that God came and died and was resurrected and five over 500 people sent, saw him and then he went back to glory and he advocates you on the, at, on the throne or in the throne of heaven, then you are saved. But what are some of the criteria of being saved? Number one, if you look at 1 John 4 and 20, 1 John 4 and 20 says this simply. It says, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So am I saved? If you don't love your brother or your sister, you got to examine that question because God said in his word, 1 John 4 20, look it up for yourself. If you don't love your brother or your sister, whom you have seen, then you cannot love me whom you have not seen. So a criteria of being saved is love, not only your brother, but your enemy. You have to love unconditionally. You have to endure the fruits of the spirit because love makes you endure all of those spirits. So brothers and sisters, what is another criteria of being saved? Let's look at another verse. First Peter 2 and 16, it says, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's servants. So number one, who set you free? God set you free. Jesus Christ set you free. But in that freedom, he wants you to live godly. Do you remember the woman who was caught in the act and the leaders brought her before Jesus Christ and Jesus was writing? He bent down, he stooped down and he wrote in the dirt. 
He probably wrote in that dirt. He who is without sin cast the first stone. You see, whenever somebody sinned, they had to have one or two or three witnesses. It could not be one against one. You had to have two witnesses. And the person who actually saw the sin had to be the person who cast the first stone. So number one, God did not give us the freedom to sin. We don't have no stones to cast at anybody because we are all wretches undone. The only reason we're saved is because of his grace and his mercy. So quit ca casting stones because you are not perfect yourself. You're made perfect through the blood of Jesus Christ, the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. So nobody cast a stone simply because they had to witness that they caught her, but there was an issue. Where was the man? You see, how are you going to cast a stone and call her innocent when there was another party who was guilty? I mean, call her guilty when there was another person who was an accessory to the crime and you didn't bring them out there. So no, if you were to cast a stone, then the same uh, sentence that you tried to get on them would have passed to you. So everybody walked away. So number one, because we are saved, we are free. We are no longer slaves to sin. Get it? We are free now, no longer slaves to sin. So God says, now that I freed you from the containments and the confinements and the destruction of sin, now you need to not sin anymore because you're free from sin. It doesn't give you free will to sin and do what you want to do. So if you're saved, no sinning. Will you be tempted? Yes, you will be tempted. That's why you need to read your Bible. That's why you need to pray. That's why you need to assemble yourselves with the saints. And that's why you need to stay focused towards the mark of a higher calling. Keep your eyes on the prize. And who is the prize? Jesus Christ in heaven for all eternity. Can you imagine whenever Jesus comes back with his triumphant, uh, in the triumphant ent uh, entry this time with all power in his hand when he stepped foot on the Mount of Olives and the big gigantic earthquake shake every mountain down to nothing, to flat. And Israel raised up out of, out of um, the ashes. And he's standing there communicating with everybody instantaneously. No sun is shining because he is the radiant light. And brothers and sisters, the millennial kingdom is getting ready to start. So yes, God is saying that we are no longer slaves to sin. So if you're a Christian, you should not want to sin. Is there a desire to do it? Of course it is because you're in a world that's full of sin and Satan is the master of this world. He is the prince of the air, the prince of the TV, the prince of the radio waves flying all over the place, your cell phones, your computers, your laptops, all of this stuff. He's the prince of this stuff. Yes, um, even in society, the way they design clothes now, everything's so clingy, nothing is modest anymore. Even, bless our souls, people coming up in church with no modesty. You go out and you, and you see them in the store, no modesty. Uh, you know, we have to be holy and righteous. We have to set an example for the world. So why are we acting like the world? Why are clothes getting so tight, even tight for men? You know what I'm saying? The devil is trying to tip us. Uh, yes, uh, I've said this many, many times. You can be going on about your business. You done done everything that you could do to the best of your ability and a thought pops in your head. It populates your mind. That's the enemy. You're dealing with a principality, an imp that has been sent into your life and it's whispering in your ear and is trying to put something there and plant a seed that never existed in the first place. All you have to do is rebuke it. If you can't do it yourself, you got to have a prayer partner. You got to have somebody that can get a prayer through with you. Because sometimes life crashes in on us and it's difficult and we can't concentrate. It pounds us. It's like, it's, it's like a heavyweight fight where it just hits you in the chin, it hits you in the temple, hits your body shot at the body shot, and you can cater in. So you need some strength. You need to go back to your corner. You need to get your cut, man, to get you straightened up. You need to get some water, drink some water, wipe the sweat off, and go back out there and start fighting again. Because we cannot sin. Because when we sin, 
then guess what? We should feel contrite about it. We should feel like it's the end of the world, like, 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 like something's been drained out of us because the Holy Spirit is indwelling us and the Holy Spirit hates it. What do you take the Holy Spirit? Let's look at Galatians 6 and 3. It says, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. See, pride goes before the fall. The biggest problem with some of us is we're too prideful to understand when we are wrong and whenever we're getting ready to make a wrong decision. Perfect example. Satan was in the mountain of God. He was he was he walked along uh, along the fiery pillars. He was around the throne of God. He had musical instruments. The most beautiful angel uh, probably could crescendo the greatest music you could ever imagine celebration going on in heaven. And because of his beauty and because of the attributes that God had blessed him with. And it's the same thing with you and I because of the attributes, the gifts, the talents that God has blessed us with. We can begin to deceive ourselves. And when we deceive ourselves, then pride begins to rise up and pride rose up in Satan. And he said to himself, I will ascend to the highest of highs. He was going to ascend higher than God. And that was impossible. And when you go back and you read all the eschatology, to logical uh, scriptures about the end time prophecies. That's what eschatology that's that's is. It's about end time prophecy. And it's right there in the book. He's read it. He knows it better than we do, but yet he still thinks he can usurp God's authority. And that's what pride is. Pride is when you get to a place to where nobody can tell you anything and you're certain to fail. And that's what Satan did. His pride swelled up in him so great that he fell. But God's pride, God's, God's, uh, God's humbleness was so great that, that he, he humbled himself and fell. And then he rose with all power because he gave his life and he took it up again. And that's the difference between humility and pride. Satan's pride created all of this chaos and mayhem, all of this death, all the people, all the wars, 15, 16,000 wars in history. Um, the, the first children, Adam and Eve's two sons, Cain and Abel, he got them to, to, to pretty much counsel themselves out because he got Cain to kill Abel. And then, and then he got the angels to go in with women and create these Nephilims and 16,000 years later, it was only eight people who would be saved. Look at all these people Satan is killing. And then, and then there was war after war after war. He came against the church. And, and then uh, he came against, the, he's going to come against the saints in the tribulation. So billions upon billions of souls have been lost because of pride. One person's pride. Not to mention he got a third of the angels in heaven to fail because of pride. So what Jesus is saying in Galatians 6 and 3, and if you are saved, then you're not prideful. People can tell you something. You don't have to be in charge of everything because when we work together, we work it out, brothers and sisters. There's always pride before the fall. Let's look at Jeremiah 23 and 11. Both prophet and priest are godless. Listen to this now. Even in my temple, I find their wickedness, declared the Lord. So God's prophets, the ones that he used, the ones that he gave authority to call down fire, to turn water into, into, into blood, to, to, to bring 10 plagues on Israel, to heal somebody with leopard, to bring somebody from the dead, brothers and sisters, even those people and the priests who served before the Lord, who had to put on garments, who had to who had to make a sacrifice for themselves before they could even come into his presence. He says that they are wicked because the I'm getting really excited. The uh, infinitesimal amount of sin is sin to God. A big sin, a little sin don't make no difference. God is so righteous and so holy that that um, all sin is sin. And when you are saved, then you know that you are a sinner. You know that you are a wretch, un done is nothing you've done to deserve God's grace and his mercy is something that he gave and it wasn't free for him because he died for you to have it but it was free for you and me and when you know that then you know for sure 
brothers and sisters, that you are wicked and God declares it. The only reason you are righteous is through, as I said, the propitiation of our sins brought by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Job 8 and 13, such is the destiny of all who forget God, so perishes the hope of the godless. Now we're getting into the state of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is whenever you say that you are saved, but you put on airs, you put on a facade, you put on a face to appear on the outside as if you're godly, but on the inside, you're full of mess. And God don't play that thing, you see. You might can fool some people some of the time, but you can never fool God any other time. And that's what a hypocrite is. You know, can you backslide? That's the question. Can you backslide? I'll get back to that a little bit later. I'm going on to Luke 6 and 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So if you are a Christian, God is saying, don't be calling his name if you're not obedient. Obedient is better than sacrifice. Ask my brother Saul. Saul was, we were studying the book of Samuel uh, just before Christmas, and, and I never knew Saul was so corrupt. I never knew that, that, uh, that he wanted all the glory for himself, and he did everything for vain glory. He didn't do nothing that God told him to do. He did it so that people would praise him. He even erected it. An altar for himself after after um, they had defeated one of the foes that God told him to to go and defeat instead of erecting it for God. So yes, he was a he was a very very um, dishonorable man. And what God is saying, if we're Christians, then don't be calling on Him unless you are a servant of His, because the Holy Spirit is the one who takes your supplications to God and moans and groans. And if he's not with you, who's going to take it to him? You understand what I'm saying? Nobody. So what God is saying is simply this. If you're not with me, I'm not with you. We're not, we're not down together. We're not, we're not getting down like this. You can't be calling on me and serving Satan. Whenever, whenever Satan gets tired of you, whenever he, he takes this thing and he makes it look all nice and shiny for you, and then, and then he gets you way out there in the ocean and, and you're standing far from the peaceful shores, sinking to rise no more. Don't call on the name of Jesus. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. But if you're contrite, hey, God is a God of chance after chance, as long as you got breath in your body. But if you say you save, act saved, stay saved, and be saved. I'm going to go on to Luke. That was Luke uh, 6 and 46. Do I have any comments down there? Anybody have a question they want to ask me? Luke 12 and 2. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Or hidden that will not be made known. You see, you remember when I was saying you can fool some people some of the time, but you can never fool God any other time. Right here in this word, Luke 12 and 2, it says, There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. See, these things in our head called brains and this thing, all this right here is our soul, right? That's our inner spirit force, whatever you want to call it, right? This soul thing is what connects this physical thing to the spiritual one up there in heaven. So one day, whenever we stand before God, somehow he's going to retract all the things and the information that we've done and we're going to see it right there. And he's going to have his angel standing there with his book. And then he's going to say, whoever you are, did you serve me? Or did you serve yourself? Because when you serve yourself, you're serving the devil because the devil wrestled the earth away from us because he has more power and we fell in the, well, our ancestor fell in the Garden of Eden. Through, through one man, sin came into the world. And through one man, salvation came into the world. So through Adam, sin came into the world. And we are children of Adam, so we're sinful creatures. But through Jesus Christ, salvation came to us. 
which made us free from sin. But brothers and sisters, we're forgiven of our sin. But if you are in this flesh, that sinful man, that old man is striving to get control, to wrestle control back from you. But see, you are a new creature now and the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you and he's keeping that old man contained. And when the old man is contained, then Satan is contained. But you can best believe you don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities in high places. And they are evil principalities because like I said, they kill billions upon billions of people and they want them to go to hell and they want them to suffer with gnashing and weeping of teeth and eternal damnation, hell, fire, the canker worm never cease. They want that for you forever because they know that's what they're going to get. And misery loves company. I'm going on to Mark 7. Did I finish with that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. So, like, as I said before, when you stand before God, everything you did, if you say you're saved, number one, if you say you're saved, anybody who has put their hands to the plow and look back, they are not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Once you, oh, come and taste, look and see, and look how good God is, brothers and sisters. Once you taste it of the goodness of the Lord, why would you want to go back? Were you ever saved from the beginning? How can the Holy Spirit save your soul and then it release you? Once it saves you, it keeps you. So were you ever saved from the beginning? How can you know what's coming? How can you know who covered you? How can you know who secured you? How can you know who loved you and sacrificed it, their life for you? How can you know who's going to bring you out when the world is crashing in around you? Who's going to cover your children and protect your family and go back to what? To a bottle? To a, to a pipe? It doesn't make sense. Were you ever saved? If you're asking yourself, you have to be a new Christian because if you are not sure, the more likely, and you're serving God and you're doing the best you can, then you're saved. But if you're sinning, if you love the sin, if you don't want to go to church, if you don't want to pay your tithes and your offerings, if you don't trust God, if you don't know if God is really God, if you don't know who God is, if you don't want to read your Bible and fast and pray, then something is off. Let me go on. But one day, when you stand before God, it would be nice to hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord, my humble and faithful servant. Not throw chains on him and cast them into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and the only thing you're doing is screaming and fussing and fighting on your way to hell. And that's it. You know you're guilty. There's no, I mean, it, it, you know, it, 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 it is mind boggling to me to stand before God. And I know I'm going to hell. And I know that's going to be forever. And I know there's nothing. Nobody can help me. Nobody. If I have an ought with a man, I can go to somebody else. And a judge can help me out, but he is the judge and the jury. So everything that is done in the darkness will come up out of the light. I saw Elder Searle say, Lord, help me. Yes, we all need help, Elder Searle. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. Where am I at now? I'm on Mark 7 and 6 for anybody who wants to see that. It says, he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Oh my God, he's going to call somebody a hypocrite. As it is written, these people honor, oh my God, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Am I saved? Do I talk a good talk? Do I talk about the Lord around my brothers and my sisters on Sunday for two hours? And when I go home, I do what I want to do for the rest of the week, Monday, the rest of the day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So do I live like a Christian for two hours 
out of the week or do I live like a Christian always? Am I letting my testimony, my life, draw people to God? Am I trusting in God? Or am I giving God lip service? Am I deep down on the inside, not who I say I am? Because if God is in me, then I'm supposed to be a Christian. I'm supposed to be Christ-like. But Jesus says, you hypocrite. You prophesy. You like to be seen in the public. You like for people to hear you with these elaborate prayers. You like for people to see you serving God, getting pats on the back. He says those who he who are who go into their secret closet, those are the ones he's bringing a reward to. The ones who do who do it in the open, they're not getting a reward when he comes. So Jesus says, don't honor me with your lips. Honor me with your deeds. If you don't, you're a hypocrite. And am I saved? How much time do I got? I got about five more minutes. I'm going to read one or two more scriptures. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. So, Number one, I don't have to declare who I am. People know who I am by my actions. On my job, they know I'm saved. On my job, they come to me and ask me to pray for them when, they, when, when their wives have uh, some type of cancer or some type of terminal disease. They quit cursing when they come around me. Some of them respect me. Most of them respect me because I've been this way for a long, long, long time. And you have to let your light shine into the darkness of your work environment and anywhere you go as a Christian. You understand? Because if you act like them, you get one chance and you lose your credibility and that's what Satan wants to take away from you, your credibility. When you're out there on that job and you're working with somebody of the opposite sex, they're just a person. You can't act some weird way and, 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 and expect somebody to respect you as a Christian. You have to be a Christian. You have to look at everybody as a brother or a sister. If you are a man, if there's a young lady, then you look at her as your daughter. If there's somebody your age, you look at them as your sister. If there's somebody older, you look at them as your mother. And vice versa for women. If there's a, if there's a young man, you look at him as your son. And if there's a, a man your age, you look at him as your brother. And if there's an older man, you look at him as your father. That is how Christians view other Christians and other people. Because we have to draw people unto God. But it says, and then Matthew 6, 1, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. By them. If, you, if you do, you will have no reward. Now, what they're saying is you be who God called you to be. And God called you to be a Christian. You be holy and you be righteous. But don't overexert yourself in it. Holy be to God. Glory be to God. And all of this. I'm saved. You don't have to do that. Because they can look at the way you act and tell. And whenever you get the opportunity, tell them about the goodness of the Lord. Don't make it about you. Make it about him. And that's what Jesus is saying. So if you're saved, you don't draw the attention to yourself. You draw the attention to the Almighty. And this is the last one, Romans 10 and 3. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. So if you are saved, then you know God is holy and God is righteous. And with holiness and righteousness comes judgment. All sin shall be punished. God's wrath will be poured out on sin. So number one, if you are saved, then you should fear God because the beginning of knowledge is fearing God, knowing that he is almighty, knowing that in the end, he makes all the decisions, 
knowing that God loves you and that God never meant that any man should perish, but every man should have eternal life and have a relationship with him where they will be in bliss and happy and joyful for all eternity, all knowledge being revealed to them forever. That's how intelligent God is. God can reveal knowledge for all eternity. I can't imagine being in heaven. I can't imagine being in the millennial reign for a thousand years and God is ruling the earth with an iron rod, but he's holy and is righteous and you are drawn to him like a moth to the flame. There's nothing he wants from us but love and adoration. And he gives that Mil a million fold to us. We're complete with him. And brothers and sisters, we cannot deny our holy and righteous judge because with righteousness comes judgment. He sacrificed his only begotten son so that we may have a right to be grafted into his kingdom, a right to the tree of life. I hope I help you out tonight with that question, am I saved? Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for a new life, a new life and a new start. And God, we thank you that you've always been there for us. You've never left us, nor have you ever forsaken us. We thank you for your word, for it's instructing us. It's keeping us righteous. And God, it's, it's inspiring us. And whenever we uh, stray, it reprove us. And God, as we assemble once again in Bible study, we ask that you not only let us be hearers of the word, but let us be doers of the word. Because we should not worship you with lip service. We should worship you indeed. Bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Even restore their virtue as they sleep and slumber on tonight. Let them awake, rejuvenated, and revitalized and ready to serve you with a brand new start. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, Pastor Searles coming from Coach Chapel, Free Will Baptist Church. I pray that all is well with you and your family. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you.